Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away, so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and he blessed and he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Amen. Let's pray together. Dear God, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. So what do we do with miracles? What are we supposed to do? To me, it's a it's a question that that runs through our texts and can guide us as we think about it for today. What are we supposed to do with these two stories? What are we supposed to do with this place, with one another, with the gifts that we have to take into the world? What are we supposed to do? This story is a miracle. And it's a miracle that I want to qualify in two different ways. First, it's more of a miracle than it sounds because this is the feeding of the 5,000. And there's also the feeding of the 4,000. But that's not true. This is 5,000 men and women and children. This is the feeding of the 10,000, the 15,000, the 20,000, the I don't even know how many. And the feeding of 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish, well, the greatest lunch lady in the world couldn't pull that off. Five loaves and two fish to feed 5,000 people, but that's not all. It's like a late night commercial. That's not all, there's more. There's all the women and there's all the children. It's a miracle. The second thing that makes this story fairly unique is other than the crucifixion, this is the only story that appears in all four Gospels. Jesus is only born in two of them, and he's only resurrected pretty much in three. But this story, this story, and the other story of the feeding of the 4,000 that's in two Gospels, these feeding stories are crucial and important, and they show up in every gospel account. So what are we supposed to do with miracles? Well, I think first and foremost, we need to be willing to believe that they occur. 
be willing to see God moving. God moving not just in history, not just in this wonderful book that we read and share, not just through others, but God moving here and now to actively believe in God with our whole heart and mind and soul and strength. For those are the things Jesus said prepare us to then be able to love our neighbor as ourselves. Be willing to see and to know that God is moving here and now. At the same time, we're called to do that while thinking critically. We are called to, to love God with our whole minds, with the intellect that we have, with the understanding and knowledge that we can share together. It isn't to check out and say it's all miraculous, but it is to say that there are times that things happen that cannot be explained. Thank you for bringing that into our midst today. There's nothing we can do. It's time to say goodbye. No, not this time. This time something is happening that is beyond what medical people and others could see in front of them. It was more than what could be seen and understood. It's in the territory of a miracle. So as we look at these stories, as we think about them critically and faithfully, what are we supposed to do? Our story, our text in Isaiah, is a rich and wonderful story. I, I liked your ho. It was like a tap on the shoulder. You know, where I'm more of a ho, hey, you know, I... Uh, But all of these things, all of this abundance and all of this understanding, and, and what does it mean? Buy things, but buy them without money and without price. And spend your money on bread, but not that which is not bread. Eat what is good. Listen so that you may live. You will call nations that you don't know. And nations will run to you that you don't know. So how, how do the people proceed? And they proceed with discernment to understand what's good bread and what's not good bread. To understand what is good and what is not. To listen, to live, to discern, to take in, to think deeply, and to carry with them this understanding of this God who loves them, who loves us, who provides for them, who provides for us. Now our text from Matthew starts with one of those phrases that should give you pause. When he had heard this, what? And what he had heard was of the brutal death of John the Baptist, his cousin. When he had heard this, when the disciples of John had come to him and told him that John was gone, Jesus chose to step away. Jesus chose to get into a boat by himself and to go to a deserted place on his own. When I grieve, when I need time to reflect, I often am on the move, and I'm often by myself. That's who I am. And so this idea of Jesus rowing a boat deep in thought, heading toward a place with time and space to reflect on what this means, this man who baptized him, who is now gone, Perhaps he was wondering, what does this mean for me? To step away is a perfectly legitimate way to grieve. 
And Jesus models that for us here. But when the crowds heard it, they went toward him. The guy in the boat heading that way means if we haul this way, I think we can be there when he comes ashore. Because it's also okay to gather with people who grieve. To say, I am with you. To say, you are not alone. Perhaps not to say anything at all, but just to be a powerful presence. It's a perfectly legitimate way to meet grief. So Jesus heads off in one direction, and they head off literally in a different direction but wind up in the same place for the same reason. They are there because of death and loss and grief and compassion. And so in that, as they come together, Jesus has compassion for them. Love your neighbor as yourself. We are here with compassion for you. And Jesus looks up and says, I have compassion for you. And he cures their sick. So then, the core of our story. They were hungry. It was time. It was time for food, and it was time to get there before sundown when nothing would be available. The disciples thought that they were practicing compassion too. To keep them here means when they finally go to the villages, they won't be fed. So send them away. And Jesus says, no. You give them something to eat. And so they huddle. What did you bring? What did you bring? What did you bring? Twelve people, five loaves, two fish. It's all that we have. It's not enough. It won't work. Perhaps they're questioning Jesus, or perhaps they're just being honest. You must have thought that I brought my other outfit (laughs) that's full of food, but I didn't. This is all we have, five loaves and two fish. And the crowd that had followed him sat waiting for whatever was next. And Jesus said, bring them to me, five loaves and two fish. And he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And so they took it as it came out of Jesus' hands, one one pass after another after another through a crowd of 5,000 plus people. Let's call it 10,000 plus. 10,000 plus people, 12 at a time. The quantity is one thing. The pace of this for the disciples is another. 10,000 people served 12 at a time and not just served with a pass by. Here's a bite for you. No, to sit and to eat until they were full. To sit and to eat and a Abundance to sit and to eat and say, no more. And then for that no thank you to add up to 12 baskets full of food. We only have five loaves and two fish. No, you have 12 baskets of leftovers, one for each of you, one for each perhaps of the 12 tribes of Israel, one of 12, an important biblical number. If you hear sevens or twelves or forties or seventies, those are really important biblical numbers to catch and pay attention to. This is 12, 12 baskets. 
What the disciples couldn't do when this started, but they could do when this story was over, was see things the way that Jesus saw things. To say this is not about your lack, but this is about the abundance that you have. This is about an abundance that you have. It is about you having more than you think you do. You having more ability than you think you have. You having more responsibility than you think you have. See this situation the way I see it. So we need to be willing to understand about miracles. And we need to discern the things that are in front of us. And we need to be willing to follow this Jesus who leads us. But we also need to be willing to see and understand through eyes of faith. What was their role? What was the possibility that they could bring to the situation? What was their responsibility? And Jesus guided them in a different direction. It was a miracle. So for us, we need to be aware. To be aware as witnesses to the fact that God is continuously moving in the world around us. In spirit. God in spirit moving in us and between us and through us and far, far beyond us. To be witnesses. To be aware of needs that we can see and to discern our response to those needs. To be aware of God and of the possibilities that are in us because not just who we are, but whose we are. And so then we serve we are called to serve as the hands and feet of God in the world, seeking to build up the kingdom of God here and now, seeking to be a part of God's kingdom-building work, and continuing to reflect on our friends at Micah 6 by doing justly, by loving mercy, and by walking humbly with our God. We are fed in so many ways by God, who calls us to step away on our own, who calls us into community together, who sustains us, who unites us, who guides us, by God who loves us, truly loves us, right here and right now. Amen. Let love lead. Let God lead. Let love lead. Let love lead. Let God lead. Let love lead. We begin to succeed when the cares of our lives begin and end with the hurt of others. Yeah. We begin to breathe when the wounds of others become relieved with the love of others oh. he who looks around to find who's in need has made the best investment as a human being you know that he who looks around to find who's in need has made the best investment in his legacy i say that love will never force love will never quit love ain't never lose and love ain't never miss All things lasting there remains only three When money can't buy Only these will succeed Faith, hope, and love The greatest of these is love So here is a formula For every hard situation Just let God Love
Let love lead. Let God lead. Can love struck? No way. Can love destroy? No way. Does love a little? Oh, no, no way. No, no. Can love close? No way. Oh, be proud. No way. Can love rejoice when a mother cries? Love stands up when not just one. Love prevails and without one. Love moves up with anything. Cause God is love and love is God. All things last and never. Let love lead. Let God lead. God is love.